the Okay, you have the okay, we are posting the other Zoom links as well. Okay. All right. Okay, so I think I'll start. So most of you are from physics and chemistry and uh, materials, and then uh, hopefully you're joined with a laptop. Um, The screen All right, so quantum simulations of materials using quantum espresso, that's what we are going to, what I'm going to talk about today. Now, I started at Peradenia, moved on to Mississippi State, and then to Central Michigan and North Texas. Um, from Peradenia onwards, I was doing computational physics, and I ended up doing uh, high throughput frameworks and computational materials databases. This is my supervisor and the, uh, uh, the PhD group that I worked in at Mississippi State. Um, so the part one of this would be a very brief introduction. Normally um, the, the workshops or the summer schools for uh, quantum espresso spans from uh, three to 10 days. So I'm gonna, basically give you a, a taste of quantum uh, simulations done using uh, quantum espresso. I won't be able to uh, sort of uh, help you to figure out all the problems you have today in setting these things up, but uh, I will, I will uh, address most of the problems for a basic calculation. And then I will uh, direct you to the uh, online workshop that was conducted in this year, in May of 2021, by the Quantum Espresso Foundation. They regularly conduct workshops, uh, summer schools that are, that, that are multiple day uh, summer schools, and they have the videos as well as the hands-on material all available on the web. So I'm using their materials today, as well as uh, we are using something else, the Burai uh, interface as well. But uh, so uh, this is just uh, your first taste of this uh, field. Uh, if you want to continue or want to have uh, an in-depth understanding, you definitely have to at least watch uh, the first few days of the workshop and do the um, uh, hands-on material uh, by yourself. Uh, and try to figure out the problems uh, using the forums. Okay, so uh, why do we need computational material simulations? So um, each of the eras of human history is marked by a, a, a material, right? We had the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, Iron Age, um, Middle Ages are called the Porcelain Age, and we are now in Silic, we have passed the Silicon Age, now we are in uh, in an age called uh, materials by design. What do you mean by materials by design? So this is from uh, one of the uh, science fiction movies where you have the periodic table uh, and uh, you can construct uh, new elements uh, using uh, the periodic table. They are not there yet, but uh, we can uh, definitely construct new materials. So, uh, this is where we are going, and that is where we've been traveling since uh, since the last uh, century. So we started in 1902, started with uh, synthetic rubies, and we ended up with phosphorine, which is a 2D material. And we are still, in, I think, innovating 2D materials and layered 2D materials. Um, so now we have passed the stage where we uh, find a material and see what we can use it for. We are now uh, at the stage where, okay, we need a material to do this, so let's make that material. So to do that uh, experimentally, it's, uh, it's, uh, it takes a long time. So any material that, uh, that was discovered and the time it took to come to market was, is about 20 to 30 years. So 
uh, we want to we want to uh, accelerate this right and this started uh, in in the us with the materials genome initiative and they started to bring in together the computational people the experimental uh, the industry and the data and, and 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 people who are hosting the data both experimental and computational and make a network of uh, material scientists uh, to accelerate this so this was back in 2013 uh, so four years of us, eight years have passed since and uh, it's still been explored now you can simulate materials at different length scales uh, so when i'm talking about length scales materials you can look at from a very macroscopic uh, aspect <clears throat> which is what the industry industries like automobile industries or or most of the industries in Sri Lanka are concerned with the macroscopic, where it's the macro scale. Uh, you're not looking at the atomic structure mostly, but you're looking at what you could do with the material, uh, what, what particular part of an automobile or a, or a machine or, or a building or something like that, uh, what you're going to do. And that can be simulated at the macro scale. But the macro scale properties are a result of the microstructure and then the atomistic and the electronic structure of the material. So if you want to dig deeper and see uh, why a certain material is failing at a certain temperature or a certain uh, stress level, you want to look at the microstructure and, and move on to the atomistics and see how you can modify this at the electronic scales, which is the angstrom level. So we are talking about 10 to the minus 10 meters when we are uh, in the electronic scale, all the way up to uh, one meter length scale at the macro scale. So you have this multi-scale uh, material simulation paradigm where each of the scales feeds into the next scale. So you, if you start with the electronic scale, the simulations done there can, can feed into uh, the atomic, atomistic scale and then go on to the microstructure and uh, then on to the macro scale. So in, in each of these, uh, so uh, density functional theory and quantum espresso sits at the very bottom at the electronic scale 10 to the minus 10 angstrom level uh, whereas you have the uh, interatomic potentials and uh, semi classical and you know uh, potentials uh, force fields molecular mechanics all of that in the atomistic uh, range then you have dislocation dynamics crystal plasticity all the stuff that the mechanical engineers and the material scientists do at uh, at the at the microstructure scale and at the macro scale you have the finite elements constitutive modeling and uh, things like that um, so i basically work at the lower two scales and the final finite elements we have used that uh, to give a few projects to the technology students uh, because they, they are mostly uh, concerned with industry and one of the things i saw was that even in sri lanka uh, the Lodestar company was using Abacus to uh, model uh, tires, uh, what they call these, uh, they're not pneumatic tires, they're they are just filled tires, but the tire structure, they used uh, finite elements to uh, model that. So it, it's, it's, it's uh, being implemented in Sri Lanka as well, and there's potential uh, for, the, for the computational uh, R&D to be absorbed into industry. Okay, so I want to give a very high level introduction to what it is that you're modeling. So if you look at a, a piece of iron, right? This is a, a local blacksmith. If you go and uh, see that they heat the iron and then once you heat it, you can uh, you know, uh, uh, shape it the way you want by hammering it. But what happens when you're heating this is, uh, is that you have this structure of atoms that's going to get uh, all disturbed. They're going to move uh, This is what Richard Feynman calls uh, the atoms, the jiggling atoms. So atoms start to jiggle, to dance. And uh, as, as energy rises, uh, as you give energy through heat, uh, the atoms will absorb that and uh, they will start to move around. And this is what happens in the, in the, in the atomic scale. We don't see this. We see the, um, the color of the uh, 
piece of iron uh, changing, we see it emitting smoke or whatever that is atoms going off. But uh, we don't, we don't, I mean, our naked eye cannot see this. Now, the quantum mechanical description goes down to the atoms, right? You have to see the atoms and the electrons. Uh, electrons are inside the atoms. So you want to see the atoms and the nucleus and how to, uh, if, you have, if you want to model at the electronic scale, you want to see how can I model this particular jiggling of the atoms using a description from the electrons and the, uh, and the nuclear cores. So the way we do this is we say, okay, this particular block of iron, right? We want to give a mathematical function for this particular block of iron. So let's give it a function. We know it, it has a number of particles, one to n. Um, you, can, you can take the nuclear core separately and give another function, but let's take everything together. You have uh, the nucleus and the electrons all together, n number of particles maybe, and then you give uh, a function. This is what we do, right? To, to model anything, we have to represent it with a mathematical object. So the mathematical object in quantum mechanics that we use is called the wave function. So we give a wave function and we say this particular wave function is uh, dependent on the positions of all of these particles. Um, we have no clue about this wave function, by the way, for real materials. So uh, what, what, what is interesting about this is if you have the physical uh, block, if you want to measure a property of this physical block of iron, you would use a measuring instrument like, uh, like a thermometer. It can be a regular thermometer or it can be a electronic thermometer, whatever, uh, a contact thermometer, you will use that to get the measurement of the temperature. Similarly, when you're doing a computational, when you're modeling the system mathematically, you can use a measuring instrument, a mathematical measuring instrument to measure a certain property of that system. So if the system is correctly represented by an abstract function, such as uh, the wave function, then, okay, give me a second, I'm running out of that. So uh, if it is a function, then the function can be operated on by this measuring, the mathematical measuring instrument. And then that will, that will give you the function plus a value, okay? So this, this measuring instrument, we call it uh, the Hamiltonian, right? So the Hamiltonian, if you use that measuring instrument on your, uh, function, which is your mathematical object. Now, this is the representation of the real object. There's nothing different. You're doing the same thing as you are putting a thermometer and the thermometer will give you a value. Similarly, the Hamiltonian will give you a value for the particular state of the system. So this is what we will want to do. I mean, this is what quantum mechanics is. It's, it's basically, you're trying to accurately represent the, uh, uh, the interactions of the nuclei and the electrons such that you, you can extract information out of it, okay? Now, it is very similar if you look at a simple function, what you do with your derivatives and your integration, right? You apply the, uh, the D operator and you get the slope. Uh, you apply the integral, you get the area under the curve. This we, uh, as probably students of physics and chemistry and material science, you might have used this a lot. With the, but you don't probably look at this in this particular interpretation. You have the mathematical object, which is the function, and you extract information out of it by using certain instruments, which we call uh, the derivative and the integral. Now, um, you use the same similarly in, where in quantum mechanics, you have a, multi, a number of operators that you can use to measure certain things uh, from this particular wave function, that, which is a representation of the real system. Now, the problem is whenever you measure the system, the system changes. And this is the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it is, I mean, true for classical systems as well. When you are attaching a probe to the heated iron, the vicinity of the area, the area very near to that, um, to that uh, location where you're attaching the probe, the atoms will change, right? But uh, normally that is not, 
affected because your probe is of very uh, a very small probe compared to the size of the uh, size of the area of the block. So if you have your block like this and uh, you attach a probe here, the temperature here of this particular block changes because these atoms will jiggle and make these atoms jiggle in the probe. And this is where the jiggling will continue and display some value. So to make these atoms jiggle, energy has to go from this particular area to this area. So the, this particular area changes, which means your mathematical object now has changed, right? This was not the mathematical, this is not the description of this particular block that was there before you attach this probe. Before that, it was a different set of positions for the atoms, right? Whereas after you attached it, it's another set of positions. So this is what, uh, if you are familiar with quantum mechanics, is what we call the collapse of the wave function. The wave function collapses to the system which uh, you have measured. So your measurement actually changes the system, right? So that's uh, that's kind of a problem, right? So, but uh, we have to deal with that. So. You have the zero system, which you want to observe, but the moment you attach your measuring instrument, it changes to the next state. So the state of the system with the energy, because now we have attached your measuring instrument to that, and therefore your, your system is no longer the same one that was before. So this is true of any liquid that you're gonna measure. This is what I just explained also. You, uh, if you put a thermometer, that whole system is now changed, although you see, is that the system as such not changed, but you have now inserted an external object in there, changing the system. So, so this particular model, this particular numerical model, which we call quantum mechanics, uh, it's, a, it's a vast area, um, has a very simple explanation for everything. You have this theory of everything, you have this simple equation, simple looking equation, if you expand, it spills out a whole lot of um, operators and, and problems that could uh, explain everything, that could model everything uh, that we find on Earth, uh, from AR to the Ebola virus or the AR to the coronavirus, and to economists, as was given by the Laughlin Nobel lecture. Um, we can model anything. The problem is we cannot solve this equation accurately. We can, we can write it analytically, but we cannot solve it. Now, this particular Hamiltonian that I told you about, that you want to measure the energy, has a number of components in there, right? You have the energy, the different energies of the nucleus, the different interactions between the nuclei, and the different interactions between the electrons. All of this has to be considered if you want to solve this, which is an impossible task if you want to solve a real material. You can solve this for hydrogen, maybe helium, but beyond that, it's an impossible task. So what can we do to solve this is the uh, issue. So the simple answer is analytically, we cannot solve it. We can only solve this for hydrogen. So what we want to do is now make a series of assumptions that simplifies the problem and uh, reduce the dimensionality of this problem. Because you have n number of particles, let's say if you have 100 particles, if you take x, y, z coordinates, that's again three coordinates per atom that will give you 300 coordinates, which to consider. So from, from a single state to move on to the next state, you have to calculate 300 coordinates, but real materials have uh, one mole of atom will have one mole of material will have 10 to the 23 atoms alone, right? So each atom will have a bunch of electrons that that will be really hard to calculate all of these positions accurately. So we have to make measurements. So the first measurement we make is what we call the adab the adab adab diabetic uh, approximation or the bone Oppenheim approximation, where we recognize okay. The nucleus uh, is 2000 times larger in mass than the electron. So therefore, 
essentially uh, the nucleus is like yourself whereas the um, electron is like a fly that is going around your head the fly is going at a very high speed uh, compared to your movement such that you cannot even catch the fly but uh, it, it's by no means a, a correct comparison uh, you have electrons going at the speed of light uh, in these materials so or close to those speeds so uh, essentially if you can for the electron if you look from the electron's point of view the nucleus is not changing at all right so the position of the nucleus is not changed so we can we can approximate that to say okay the nuclei positions are not changing therefore we will fix them in a certain uh, number of positions uh, and we won't consider their change then the next one is okay we decouple the wave function so the wave function we have written uh, as a um, a combination of the positions of each of the electrons so if you like, if you say okay the nuclei are now we are not considering them they are all uh, frozen and uh, while the electrons are moving okay so the n now represents the electrons but the electron electron interaction uh, makes it a fact that each electron is a function of all the other positions of the other electrons so we know that as well and we say no it's only a function of its own position but not it, it doesn't care about the position of the other electrons. that's called the hart reapproximation and then you have the hohenberg cohn theorems i'm not going to go into any of this which essentially what it does is it takes this n number of particles and tells you okay you have a frozen ion core right you have the frozen nuclei core and you have a density of electrons around them okay this is the simplest way to explain this instead of considering individual particles now we are considering only a density so essentially we want to know at any given time the density n at that particular location which is a variable of xyz which is three variables so now we have essentially simplified the problem from 3n to three variables so you are looking at electron density and that's it we don't want to look at all the we don't want to know the exact positions of the electrons so once you do all this you get to a procedure called the self consistent field solution uh, the problem is we don't know the density so you have to guess the density we don't know uh, the ionic core uh, potential arising from the ion cores and then again we have to calculate that we have to construct it so there's a procedure to do this you you construct the ionic core and you get the effective potential that is uh, your ions are here right so let's say just consider a, a single line of ions so you consider a single line of ions ionic or the nuclei core and then uh, around this you have a potential or an energy uh, like an energy barrier through which the electron cannot penetrate so the electron acts on this potential so the electrons will hover above this like a density right and uh, even around this if you can visualize this in a certain way so you have to construct all of this you have to construct the positions of the uh, ionic cores and then you have to say okay give a value for this function which is your effective potential and then you have to say okay i'm going to assume a density r for the electron which is what these first uh, steps do and then they move on and solve uh, approximate equation similar to the schrodinger equation they are not solving the schrodinger equation because now we have approximated it uh, we have broken down the uh, schrodinger function which is the wave function from uh, this to this uh, one two one two and so on and because of that we are these are called the hk equations or the uh, hohenberg cohn equations we solve the hohenberg cohn equations and calculate a new density and we check the difference between our initial guess and the new density and then there's a mixing procedure to generate the new density and we do that until the error is minimized and so there is a whole lot of convergence tests you want to do 
to converge to the accurate solution. And this is why you get the self-consistent. So if you, once you um, decide that it is accurate enough, then your problem is solved. Now you can apply all your operators because what comes out of this, we call them the Hohenberg cone functions, which make up uh, the, uh, this, the, the Hohenberg cone wave function at the end of the day. So this is our approximate answer to the Schrodinger equation. Uh, the we, our approximate answer to getting the numerical object that represents this physical system, which is the wave function. So this is how we construct that. Once you construct that, you can now apply your measuring instruments to calculate the energy, the forces, the positions, or whatever. So uh, th that is the entire procedure of a DFT uh, calculation or what we call a density functional theory calculation, which is done by quantum espresso software. And the reason you need to have a general understanding of this is to run the convergence tests. This is important to get, uh, get an accurate solution. You need to run convergence and you need to understand what these convergence tests mean. Otherwise your solutions uh, are not uh, very meaningful. All right, let me erase that. So this earned the Nobel Prize, uh, I think in 1989 or 91, I forget, uh, somewhere around there, got the Nobel Prize for this. 98, sorry, yeah, 1998, Walter Cohn, uh, he passed away a few years back. I got the chance to meet him while attending a workshop at UCSB. Um, if, so once you solve this, you get the, uh, get the wave function, um, assuming that you know all the components of the uh, measuring instrument. So the measuring instrument you're using is the Hamiltonian, where, where, where I, I showed you that big equation that has uh, all the interactions there. This, this Hamiltonian uh, has a bunch of equations, a bunch of operators here. But the problem is some of these we don't know how to calculate. And uh, now we had a problem with the, with the numerical representation, which is, which is the wave function. Now we have a problem with uh, how to calculate the uh, certain interactions, which we call the exchange and correlation. So the exchange and correlation, there is another approximation that you do, which is called an exchange and correlation functional. Um, those of you who are familiar with the DFT, you might have heard uh, local density approximation or generalized gradient approximation, and then you have the, the hybrid up, hybrid functionals, uh, which, which like blip, blip three, and uh, you have these uh, HSE functionals. And uh, so there are a bunch of uh, approximations that goes on here. And the LDA and GGA are the most widely used. GGA is the most widely used. And uh, as long as you are doing uh, uh, general calculations, you should be okay with using a version of the GGA approximation. So again, we'll come back to this when we select uh, certain approximations. So he, this is a general understanding of that. LDA means local density approximation. It's coming from uh, the calculation uh, that assuming that the electron density is equivalent to the electron density of a uh, electron gas. And the gradient uh, approximation, generalized gradient, uh, it uh, calculates the uh, difference of the densities between positions. It takes that into account. Other than that, I'm not going to go into the other uh, approximations. There are a bunch. Those are called beyond DFT methods. Um, so it's, it's, it's moving away from traditional DFT. I work with DFT plus U and hybrid functionals. Uh, here, the U, we also, uh, in, in the group I work with, they reformulated DFT plus U to get the U uh, out of the calculation itself. Uh, earlier, it was that you had to put in the U parameter. So these are some advanced uh, ideas that you want to visit once you have a, a good grip on the basics. If you have any questions on this, uh, please post it on the Padlet. The Padlet has a section uh, saying post any questions on the DFT theory. So uh, I will check that uh, once I come to a certain point in this uh, discussion and then I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, 
so you're welcome to uh, ask questions in that particular uh, area. Okay, so so the the self considered solution that we want to find out uh, then is uh, it depends on the approximations and the functionals and all of that you can use. So uh, so for the first one, you want to construct this. Uh, effective potential for the ion pores that we have frozen, right? So we froze it uh, from because due to the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, and we are going to calculate the electron density. So we need to uh, have an initial guess for the electron density. That is, of course, done by the software. You don't have to give an input there, but you can also tell how, how, that, in, how that is constructed. So we need to obtain the nuclear potential for the, adab the adiabatic uh, approximation. To do this, what we do is we have to uh, consider the structure of the material. So normally you have what we call a lattice, a series of points. Uh, I'm talking about periodic materials like iron, copper, aluminum, silicon, uh, things like that. Uh, the DFT is mostly used for periodic uh, calculations, but you can use it for molecules. You can tweak it uh, to uh, uh, calculate uh, properties of molecules that are in non-periodic uh, environments that can be done. I'll explain how you do that also. So when you have this type of a point, uh, point uh, pattern, and you populate that point with what we call a basis of atoms, you get your uh, structure. You might have done this in chemistry and physics solid state. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into all those details. You have these primitive vectors, you have the basis vectors and you repeat them. Uh, I, but uh, there are definitions and you end up with a structure. So the problem here is now each of these atoms have a nuclear core and the nuclear core has a bunch of shells we know from uh, S, P, D, F uh, up to that you have all of these shells. But what this shell means it's a potential, it's a function. When you, when you model this you have uh, weird looking functions coming out which has to be represented as a Fourier transform. Now, when you have this periodic, just imagine you have this periodic uh, atom uh, array, and each of these has one of these functions going like that, right? So you have a bunch of these functions arising like this at each of these locations, right? Which you have to construct using the effective potential uh, definition or, or, or another ma mathematical construct, you have to devise to get this potential uh, generated. Of course, now here, let's draw one. So let's draw one uh, function. Let's say it's, it, 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 it dies out like that. And then that function is taken up in the next one and goes like that. So this is, a, this is sort of like a periodic function, but this never that goes to zero, right? This always comes down parallel until infinity. So normally you get a parallel function here. Now, when you consider isolated atom, this is where you can do the isolated system also. When you have the isolated one, you have to give enough distance outward so that it reaches a point where there will be no interaction with another image of this system because DFT will always create images of the system in all 3D directions. So once you give it a system, it will replicate it all around it and then uh, it will try to uh, calculate the mathematical solution. So if you want to do an isolated system, you have to make sure this particular width is enough so that this interaction dies down at the border of, the, of your um, of your uh, model, okay? So you have to construct this particular potential and this is what we call the pseudo potential. And again, you don't have to do this. This is already done for you in quantum espresso. If you are doing silicon or aluminum, you just have to go and select the pseudo potential file from the, uh, from the list. So, but you have to understand what you're doing. This is the reason I wanted to go to the background of this. So you're actually, by selecting the pseudo potential file, you're constructing the effective potentials of the ionic cores. Now, the problem is certain pseudo potential files work best. So, normally go for the PBE uh, files 
ultra soft pseudo potentials and non conserving pseudo potentials um, there is a separate workshop day dedicated to that in the uh, quantum espresso summer school uh, please go and look at that before you uh, before if you don't understand uh, what i am saying right now okay so the pseudo potentials what they do is they cannot they are, i mean we, mathematical objects cannot uh, uh, mathematical objects can handle infinity computers cannot handle infinity computers need finite distances so you cannot do calculations until uh, infinity arrives infinity never arrives so therefore we have to make the function go to zero at both ends so what we do is we say okay we define a cut off radius uh, a cut off distance basically saying okay we are not going to calculate anything beyond this so this is our cut off we we'll say anything beyond this uh, is uh, is not important to us because that doesn't affect us much because after that uh, this particular uh, interaction continues or whatever that doesn't make a, uh, a difference to the properties of the material and uh, we also smooth the function towards the center of the nucleus because when you are coming to the center of the nucleus it gets really weird the functions the mathematical objects here so it's being smoothed out and this infinity is taken out by smoothing out smoothing it out to a finite value now when you do this uh, this is not the actual effective potential so this is why you're calling it a pseudo potential pseudo means fake basically okay so um, that's what we are doing we are making an so these are educated approximations this is not approximations that you make with wild guesses this this the approximations are made such that the approximation does not have a significant effect on the properties of the material that you are predicting so it's a very uh, it's a well educated uh, uh, approximation it's not a guess uh, it's sort of an art form to uh, to uh, develop a pseudo potential and this is why you should not attempt uh, to develop one if you don't have someone to guide you i have never done that uh, so i've always used uh, uh, the potential set that is available in quantum espresso or there's another set developed by uh, developed by uh, rutgers university uh, gbrv potentials so you can use them also so if you go to the website of the quantum espresso they will give you all of these pseudo potential files they are in the upf format and uh, you will select a pseudo potential file with respect to your system so at this point i think we we need to switch gears and then start and power up the uh, burai uh, gui and see whether we can uh, whether we can run uh, we, we can i get i can show you some uh, implementations of what we've just discussed um any questions before you before i go on okay uh, one of the things i want to ask was how many of you could download the software i sent out the message late last night of course but uh, were you able to download the software uh, the burai software can you raise your hands if you were able to download it i can send the link uh, now as well it's a little larger the files i have hosted the files in the gitlab so so this is actually the max school and advanced materials modeling i will share this link uh, this has uh, all the sessions of the days so it's a 10 10 day workshop on quantum espresso which you can go through uh, they have recorded it this year they have done it completely virtual so you can uh, go through that and it's really nice let me see whether i can share the yeah so if you go to this particular link go to that particular link you can uh, you can see that there's a there's a Uh, file called burai 3.2 windows ra you can uh, download this extract it using uh, the 7 zip software if you don't have the 7 zip just type 7 zip uh, that will 
this is very small software you can just download that and go to the download page that will give you uh, a 64 bit windows 64 uh, system you just download this yeah you can download that and uh, extract it i would really like if uh, those who have installed it if you can raise your hands and tell me that you have it up and running or whatever any problems you have you can again uh, share to the uh, padlet so i have a section there uh, queues on dft queues on burai uh, any problems you have you can mention here and i will try to answer them so once you have uh, installed it so you should if you power it up it should be something like that but let me go back and and power it up for you to, so that you can see how it comes up so if you once you extract it it's going to be like that this particular file is going to be there bright 3.2 windows and you go in there there's bin you go into the bin and there's this particular icon called Burai, and then you double click that it should work if you get a message uh, saying uh, that java runtime environment has to be installed then you have to go and install the java runtime environment which is available i think i sent that also yesterday so yeah you just type java runtime in environment it just comes up yeah it normally requires 1.8 but uh, the current environment works uh, it's another software and uh, if you have a 32 bit uh, windows i don't think anyone runs 32 bit now windows offline 64 bit it's about 81 meg and you can uh, hop and download this and install that as well Uh, if you are having problems, I can uh, I can I can also can try to see whether uh, you can whether I can interface with your computer through the remote control that is available in Zoom. So I would suggest that you try to do what I'm doing here, and then uh, try to see uh, try to see how you can what are the problems that you face when you're doing this. So once you power up Burai, you have these uh, links here that uh, that navigates the place where you are accessing. Uh, there's no other way to access the, the access the uh, drives in your computer. So if you want to access them, you just go here, type the drive letter, and uh, it goes to that. Uh, yeah, let's see, drive letter and forward slash will take you to the drive and uh, my stuff is in here if i remember and i have a file but if you don't have a file then uh, you can download the file from here or you can load up a file from the examples as well i have put a file here this silicon scf uh, you can download these three files uh, the first file is the one that i have uploaded so if you just go and download this uh, yeah, you can download it using this button and it will it you can save it somewhere that can be accessed by Burai and then um, and then you can uh, load it up but uh, let's say you don't have and you don't want to do that you can also go to the examples like if you go to my projects examples uh, there are zip files there are pwscf files sorry xyz files yeah, PWCF, yeah. Yeah, this is also there. And uh, you can up, you can also load up the SIF file, which is a SIF is a format for crystal structure information and silicon is there. So let's run silicon from here. If you don't want to download the file, we can just do that. Now you will be given this particular uh, interface will come up. And uh, here you will see you have a few controls that says geometry. It says geometry right now, but if you look at, if you click that, you have geometry, SCF, optimize, MD, DOS, band. So you can do geometry. Don't select any of these. These are all advanced functions. If you just select geometry, uh, you have these particular elements. 
Now, the first thing we want to do is select uh, a pseudo-potential file. So currently it has been selected for you. In this example, it says, it gives you the silicon, it gives you the mass of the silicon and the pseudo-potential file. If you click this, you have an, uh, other pseudo-potential files. Now I told you that the exchange correlation functional is the one, is another approximation that we do. So if you want to change that, you can change Let's say you want to do PW91. Currently, there are no PW91 uh, pseudo potentials, so you can uh, choose to download one. Uh, so you can go here, select silicon. And if you go here, and it gives you the functional type, it says PWPBE. So if you want PW91, you can go and PW91, I'm guessing, is a LDA uh, functional. Let's go back. Uh, we can we can filter this out from here also. I think. No, no, we cannot. They have not given us that this file. So I don't know. We can do a find. PB solve. Okay, we have LDA. This is a LDA potential, but it's not PW. So we can we can get a we can get a normal one or we can go with the one that it's already there. Um, it doesn't matter. I just want to show you how to download one if you if you want to. PB Sol has the nonlinear co-correction, so that is also good. Anything by Andrea Dallacosa is really good. He is the maestro of uh, a pseudo potential generation. So they have used their, his code, but uh, so author, if it says author ADC, then uh, that's a pretty good pseudo potential normally. So you can select any one of these, it's, it's, it's absolutely fine uh, because PBE generally works. Um, normally the RRKJ US and the KJ PAW, this is a PAW one, uh, that's called a PAW potential. Uh, PAW ones are much more stable. So yeah, let's try to download that and see, okay. Close. Let's see whether we have that now. Yeah, we have it. Four. And you double click that, that comes up here. Okay. So another information that is given here is if you look at that, it gives you the cutoff for wave function. It says 43.744 Rydbergs. So this is given in the pseudo potential. And I will explain what that means uh, in a little while. Okay, so once you do this, uh, you, you want to put your atoms. Now this one has eight atoms in there. So the, they have given the atom configuration, which is basically the ionic core configuration where the ionic cores are. Let me see whether I'm getting any messages. Fine, uh, so. And then you go and say, okay, let's go and do an SCF calculation, a self-consistent field calculation. And once you click that, you're given the uh, different sets of uh, parameters to change. Now, max time it's set to 86, uh, 8,000 somewhat seconds. You can change this to one hour. Uh, it won't take one hour, but uh, just change it to one, if make it, uh, you can change it to one here. Yeah. Now I told you that the cutoff for wave function was given to 43. So we can check that we can just give 40 here and see what happens. Anyhow, this should be at least four times that normally 160 should be given here. The cutoff for the charge. Okay. So if you put 40 here, this is 160. This controls um, the number of wave, the plane waves that are being used to construct this particular uh, pseudo potential. So the more plane waves that I use, so as I said, uh, we are using this uh, Fourier transforms, right? We are using, I mean, you have to construct this particular uh, smooth uh, wave by putting together small, small waves. So you're putting together small, small waves, and that is how we are getting this uh, particular smooth wave. The number of uh, plane waves used to generate this 
If it increases, accuracy increases. That is the rule in DFT. So if you can run this with 80, sure, but it will also mean you're using a lot of computational power. It might not be needed. And so we want to converge in a certain way such that you use just the right amount of plane waves and then and, and the cutoff so that uh, you don't overwhelm your computer, especially if you're running on your laptop. So we, let's do it 40 for now. We can also do it 25 and see what happens. And we can leave this at, as it is. Uh, and then uh, you have these K points. I will get, get to that later. So the K points is another parameter that you have to converge to um, increase the accuracy of this calculation. OK, so once you do this, you don't have to go into this electronic optimization and stuff like that. These are all at defaults. Uh, we are doing the non-polarized calculation, which means we are not looking at magnetism because silicon doesn't have magnetism. And then what you want to do is go and check out the input file. So that you can do. So this is on the right side. Once you can uh, click SCF, you get all these options. On the left side, you have uh, another set of options where if you go and look at the input file, it tells you the text file that is going to be run in this computer. So uh, this is a graphical user interface, but Quantum Espresso is a text-based software. It, it doesn't have uh, an inbuilt uh, graphical uh, interface. So you, what this Burai does is it, it uh, creates the file and it submits it to the executable. So if you look at this, uh, you have all of these uh, values put in, they are by default coming in. So you don't have much control here because uh, Burai doesn't allow you to change stuff. Like if you want to say, no, I don't want on any of this. I just want the defaults and uh, it won't let you do that. It will like, you can do this. Let's see whether it accepts. Now it puts them back right again, right? So um, unless you want to say, let's say okay, fixed and then let's do that, okay. But still, it won't let me take this out. So, uh, so things like that are there. The only thing you can do with smearing is make this uh, de Gauss parameter really small by saying, OK, 0, 0, 1. And that should do it. Uh, that should take out uh, any effects that you get from smearing uh, function, but that's OK. Uh, this is just to get you, give you an idea of how this will work. Uh, uh, with Burai, because uh, Burai gives you the visual aspect of it. If I go straight away to the text one, you're going to be lost. This is why I started with the Burai. Now, once you do that, you have to run this. And when you are going to run it, it is ask, it will ask you to save the project. So it also asks how many processors you want to use. I want to use one. Uh, don't use more than you have in your computer. Normally, it's two or one you have. Uh, so I'll use one. It's a job type is SCF. There are other job types, but we're just doing our SCF. And then you save this project. And then it asks for, for a location to save. So I will give a location here. SI. I'll do two just to say it's so okay. Once you do that, uh, it will start running. Okay, last access uh, probably to download the uh, sort of potential file. And I think it calculated it. And then what you do is you go to this tab and uh, click it here again and look at result. Now, if it ran okay, you don't see an error file. Uh, you have, they list the files in this project. And you can see the log file. This is the this is what uh, the software spits out after it runs. So it lists a bunch of stuff. 
So it says uh, number of atomic types one, number of electrons 32, number of states 16. So uh, cutoff energy used 25. Uh, and then also it should give number of atoms is eight, yes. So things like this basic stuff it gives and then you have the crystallography stuff uh, coming out. But the most important one we are looking for is energy because that's what we're gonna measure. Energy is given with an exclamation mark. So if you search the text for the exclamation mark, you will get total energy value in Rydberg's, okay? So the conversion from Rydberg's to electron volts is I think you have to multiply by 1.8 or something, 1.83 if I'm not mistaken. Um, so normally we deal with electron volts, but uh, you can, the, the quantum espresso uh, output is in Rydberg's. So do not take it as electron volts if you're familiar with, the, with software such as WASP that gives uh, values in electron volts. So this is an initial SCF calculation, right? That we do, that we do to uh, that we do to get the energy of this particular system. So what I want to now do is uh, see, okay, what happens to this energy if you change the cutoff value for the wave, for the plane waves? So we were talking about the pseudo potential file and the number of plane wave changes if you change the cutoff value uh, in the input file. So let's try to do that. So uh, I've, I've copied that here. So the input file here is uh, it ran with 25 uh, Rydberg cutoff energy. So I'm gonna put that into an Excel. So let me put that into an Excel. Sorry. So 25, we got uh, this value. Okay, that's the value we got in Rydberg. So we have the E cut WFC versus E tot, which is the total energy. So let's get uh, a few more values for this. It's not that hard to get because uh, we can quickly run this. Uh, we go to the input file or even here, you can, you can change it here. Uh, instead of 25, let's do 30. 35, let's do 35. Okay, it updated to 35. You want to see whether it updated to 35 in the input file. That's that's one thing you want to check. Okay, and then we will run this. It will run again. And wait until this becomes green. That means it's done. And then you go and see the result. And let's go to the log file. Again, we will search for this. And now you have a different value. And that is for 35. So you put that into your Excel and you see 35, it's gonna give you, we have not changed the system. We are just increasing the number of plane waves and you can see there's a change in the energy, right? The change in the energy is uh, at 0 0.0, two Friedbergs, right? So there is a change in the energy. So it depends on which particular amount of energy you want to converge to. And then again, yeah, you can go and change this to, let's say 45. And now this is not enough because you need four times this. So four times this is 180. Then we will see whether the input file reflects that. Yes, it does. And then run it again. So you have to keep doing this if you have multiple values that you want to test for a parameter like the energy cutoff. Okay. 
Okay. So this is also not per atom energy you're seeing. You're seeing the uh, energy for the whole system. So you go to the log again, and then you type this, you're gonna get another one. And this time uh, it's a lot closer than uh, to, the, uh, to the earlier one. It has converged, it has changed in the third decimal point. So the um, second decimal point is converged now. Let me increase the size so that you see this. So we see the second decimal point converge, convergence coming up, right? Uh, two uh, values have represented that. So let's just try 50 and see what happens. Uh, so go back and we try 50 here. So when you do that, you have to increase this to 200. And then check for the input file to see whether it was reflected. Okay, it's there. And then you run this again. So it'll take a little more time because now we have increased it a little bit more. So you, when you're running it in one processor, you will feel that the time increase as, uh, as you uh, want more accuracy of this calculation. Okay. You can also look at the time. I didn't look at the time. The, the output file actually gives you the time. If you go down right to the bottom, it gives you the time it spent on each of these uh, steps. So convergence achieved in five iterations. And then uh, it gives you the time. Uh, this, these are the wall times that they have, the number of CPU seconds each of these routines took. And I think it gives a final one. It takes 14.88 CPUs but, and a wall time of uh, 20.05 and was terminated on at 10.46, 19 December. So all of this is recorded in here. Let's search for the total energy. Okay, so total energy, you can get it from here. This is total energy. So we copy that. And uh, now you can probably see it's converged to the third decimal point, right? Yeah, you have a third decimal point convergence. Now, if you plot this data, Insert chart. Uh, you want to put a, I don't know, what do you want to put? You want to put a single line, I never know how to put that in Excel. No. That's not what I want to do, but uh, yeah, that's fine. I'll show it to you when I was, I'm doing the, uh, there we go. All right. So you see a sharp decrease in energy, right? From 25, when you're coming to towards 40 and 45, 50, you don't see that, but between 25 and 45, you see that they, there's a there's a bit of an energy change. Of course, the score, scale is very small, but uh, you see that the convergence is achieved near 40, 45. So for 40 to 50 would be a good range. You are changing only the third decimal point. But then again, this is in Rydberg. So if you want to converge this, convert this to uh, electron volts, It's going to be something like that. And then you, you want to see the convergence in electron volts. And if you want to converge to electron volts, uh, then you will see that it's not even converged at the third decimal point. So electron volts, we only shoot for second decimal point convergence. Whereas in Rydberg's, you go for third decimal point convergence because that will be the equivalent of a second decimal point convergence in electron volts. Right. So uh, you see that at 35, uh, it's already converged to the second decimal point. So uh, maybe 40 would be a good idea to run. So what you do is then, okay, you want to get the final one. Uh, 
my projects. Please let me use. You can then run because we didn't run with uh, we didn't run with uh, forty. So you can try and run with forty and see instead of this. Write forty and then uh, check the input file and then you run again. So this is very essential before you start calculating or, or measuring anything uh, or saying okay this particular energy is correct. Uh, you want to make sure that you have converged to the correct uh, values of the energy, whether the energy changes with, with the approximations that you take inside of your calculation. So that that part you are okay. Um, I think I'll have a, a small discussion. Then, if we can, we can have a small discussion on what you understood or what what problems you have. So if you go and look here again, the total energy is now this much. So let's copy that back to our file. I'll insert a so insert here. So it's 40 and then is this. So you see that it's already converged to the third decimal point. 40, 45 is third decimal point, and then onwards, of course, the third decimal point also changes. But uh, you see that 40 is enough. You don't have to go to 45. So you save on computational uh, resources when you're deciding on that. And if you take 25, then you might be off by one decimal point, uh, one, one decimal point. It's good if you can go to one milli electron volt convergence, but uh, it's hard, right? Uh, so one milli electron volt convergence, we can say 40, we have that uh, because 45 replicates the third decimal point. Uh, so one milli electron volt is a good uh, aim to have. So one MeV, we say one MeV, this is M, this, this is EV, and uh, this is in Bridberg's. So when you are converging, it's better to converge to one MeV if possible. Uh, keep that as a goal. So uh, try to converge to that point. Okay. So any questions? Any questions? Anything to ask? Uh, any comments uh, on what you need? If if what you need is not happening, uh, I would like to have some feedback. So if you have not, you know, how many of you just uh, tried to do this with me? Can you raise your hands if you tried uh, to replicate what I'm doing? Um, it's 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 good if you can try and uh, give me some feedback. If you have problems, you can ask me. Or any any other question you want to ask me? Yeah, let's take a like a seven minute break until eleven o'clock. So we have yeah ten fifty three. So we can uh, take a small break and I'll show you the the other way of doing this using a Linux system because uh, Windows is good if you have the patience to uh, do these changes by hand and do it but uh, when you when you want to do things when you want to automate things uh, windows is hard you'll have to install some other software like python or something and then you have to script it and call the bri you'll have to make an input file and then it's a whole process whereas uh, you can set up scripts very easily in linux so I'll switch gears after 11 and show you some of that. Um, so we'll take a five, five, ten, five minute break and uh, let me know if you have any questions, please uh, post or you can talk also, I'll be here.
is the padlet inaccessible because uh, can you all just test whether you can write on the padlet any questions you have does it show the posts hello okay okay good right uh, so yeah if you have any questions you can uh, post it over there or you can ask i mean it's fine i'm just uh, just want to keep a record of what was going on So uh, I will uh, now go to uh, the Linux version of this is, uh, is, I think I sent another email. In the email, there was another link to a virtual box, a virtual machine, uh, which could be run using virtual box. So the way to run this is uh, you have to download the virtual box from the site. Uh, this particular site, this is the virtual box that they used for the, uh, school so the second link this particular link is working and you can download this and this is what i downloaded and when you download it uh, yeah let me close this and What you will get when you download is an OVA file, which is uh, which is similar to this one. Uh, you will have an OVA file like that. This open visualization file for visualization format archive. It's about two point four gigs. Uh, QE 2021. And then what you want to do is you want to go to VirtualBox. Uh, and uh, VirtualBox uh, link was also sent to you. So you want to go to VirtualBox uh, website here. And uh, if, if you went to the download page, no, I, I think I sent you this. Yeah, downloads page. You go to Windows hosts. I think most of you are running Windows. Uh, if you are running a Linux distribution, uh, you can also go to the Linux distribution and install that. And uh, the other one is then you go to the Windows hosts and uh, it will download uh, the required uh, Windows file. So I've downloaded VirtualBox 6.1.3. I'm not going to download it again. So once you do that, you install that. And once it's installed, uh, you can power it up. It's Oracle VM virtual box. I think it's already open. This is why it's not responding. Okay, so it should give you something like that. And then you go to file and import appliance. You do an import appliance. Uh, or what you can do is uh, easier than that. You go to your place where you download this thing and you double click this. If you double click that, it, uh, once it's installed, it will try to import that. And you can say machine base folder. You can uh, select a, a drive which has about 10 gigs of uh, space. And you can also select the number of CPUs in your computer. Uh, and the num amount of RAM you want to dedicate to this uh, machine. And then you click import in imports and it takes some time. 
but uh, then finally you get something like this and it says powered off uh, it says you to refresh this log but it doesn't matter and then you just press the start button so this is basically an operating system uh, that's going to run inside of windows uh, that has all the uh, necessary softwares and the training and the handout, handout material for their Honom Espresso workshop uh, that they have run uh, in May. And, uh, and it, it allows you to run Honom Espresso without the hassle of installing it in a system. Like if you want to install Linux and then install uh, all the necessary software to run uh, Quantum Espresso, such as G Fortran, GCC, and all of that. Uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, and they have given username and password for this in the website. Again, I think I shared this uh, yesterday, so you can go and look at that. So this username and password is user and QE 2021. So you type that user QE 2021, and it logs you into this Mac school on advanced materials and molecular modeling with Quantum Espresso um, virtual machine that they have prepared. They have all the handout materials, day one through day six. Uh, they are there, uh, we are gonna look at day two. Uh, that's what we did uh, with Bari. So um, if you go into this folder, you see it's, there's an example one, silicon example two, aluminum example three, iron. So this is this is the uh, the uh, semiconductor and then the, uh, or the uh, non-metal and this is the metal and then this is the magnetic metal that they have discussed in the first day. Uh, yes, yeah, summer school link. Uh, I, I, I think I sent to. Ah, you mean the videos? I think yeah. I'll I'll I'll, I'll share that. Uh, give me a second. Yeah, this is the link for their school. When I mean, if you download this particular. Uh, uh, virtual machine, you have it all. You don't have, need to download the files, it's already downloaded. So you go there and download the virtual machine, which, uh, which I, or if you want to download just the files, that also you can do. They have the files available in the uh, in GitHub. So that the GitLab, of course. And uh, if you want to look at the videos, these are the videos. So, They are pretty long. Uh, each of them is close to two hours, and uh, they discuss a lot of things. Uh, yeah, one and a half hours to two hours. Some they are going over two hours. So those are the links to the summer school. Um, if you go into this day two, you also have a handout in day two, and this is done at ICTP and a uh, lot of organizations involved. These are pioneers of the Quantum Espresso. So they've been doing this for decades. Um, they explain how to set up your basic convergence tests in silicon. That's the first exercise that we have walked through and see uh, what will what, what the parameters look like in the file. So uh, Burai, of course, uh, sort of automates everything. Uh, and, and Quantum Espresso has that capability as well, but now it's script based. It is not, uh, it, it is text based now. So you will have to log on to, uh, you have to use the terminal. So this is the terminal. Can you all see my screen? Can you all see the terminal? Uh, yes. Right. Okay, good. Right, so I'm gonna change to the desktop. This is just CD is changed. Can you, can you Dr. Rajiv, please uh, slow down a bit? <laughs> yeah, so you can click this particular square, make terminal, right? So this is how you access the terminal. So 
let's close everything. Now we have like if once you logged on, you have this uh, setup. You have these folders. They basically are same, similar to Windows. You can double click; it opens the folders. You will see folders inside of it. You will see some README files, and uh, you have uh, certain. Uh, I mean, whatever they put in there, it's there. And uh, we are going to date too. But the problem is now we cannot do the click uh, method to uh, execute this software. Um, it's you have to go to the terminal and type a text-based uh, commands to run this, which they have automated to a certain amount. So uh, in in the Linux, uh, you have this terminal. You can access the terminal from different uh, places. You can go to accessories here and get the net. Oh, I thought it's in the accessories. It's not. Maybe it's in the system tools. System tools and mate terminal. And they have put that in the quick access bars as well. So you can get this from here also, right? And uh, or if you are here, I think Alt T will open up a terminal. It's in something like that. There's a shortcut. Doesn't matter. Forget. Okay. Control Alt T. So control and alt, and then if you press T, you will open up a terminal also. So that way, if you don't want to click, you can do that. And if you want to enlarge the letters, you press control, shift, and plus, and then this will enlarge the letters on the terminal. Okay. So I've enlarged it so that you can see what I'm typing. And then you change, so you're, the place where you are, you are at a folder, right? So which is, well, what is that folder? If you want to look at it, you just type PWD. So you are at home folder inside user. User is your uh, account name. So if you want to list what is in user, you do LS and it lists all the folders in there. Uh, you want to go to this QB, you want to go to the desktop. Okay. So if you go to the desktop, you'd say CD desktop, and then you have the 10 days, the work for the 10 days, yeah, the folders are there. So then you have to go to day two. Right. And then day two, you have example one, two, three, and then the readme file. So then we change to example one. We're just changing directories. It's similar to double clicking a directory. You are just using a command now. So you go inside and you can't see anything when you go inside. So you have to, if you want to see, you have to type ls. So when you type ls, uh, so in, inside of example one, there's exercise one, exercise two, exercise three, exercise four. So the exercise one is the convergence of ecut e wfc, which we did with this uh, Excel uh, file. We did that and uh, we, we tried to see which uh, number of uh, we, which uh, cutoff is best suited for us? Okay. So now I'm so let's go into that exercise, and I'm going to do an ls to see what's in there. I'm going to remove this files dot in and dot out because I ran it and the dot that file. So this is what it's in there um, right at the beginning. So you have a pwtk file. Which is which is the set of commands that you want to run uh, to get this uh, get this graph, get the graph that we generated with uh, with uh, Excel. But we had to do this one by one. So in in, uh, in 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 Linux, you can batch process this. So if you look at so if you want to look at the text file pwtk e cut off e cut wfc pwtk, you say more show me more of that file and then it will show the file but now we have to reduce this size so to reduce again you do control and uh, the negative sign it will reduce this uh, text font size for you so what this does is it, it has a template file that is going to be loaded and then it's going to substitute the e cutoff values from 12 to 40 so if you want more than 40 we can edit that uh, in steps of eight. So it's going to go 12, 20, 28, 36, 
it's like that okay and uh, the next one should be 44 but yeah so you can it, it will substitute all that values it will run the pwx command which is pw.x is the condom the uh, the condom espresso software uh, or the code the compiled code to run the dft calculation so it will run the pwx calculation uh, it, it will substitute the cut value run it then it will extract the total energy write it to a file and finally it will plot it it will run this in a loop it's a for loop it will run everything and then it will plot it so it's uh, they have put some comments here it is easier to understand so everything inside these curly brackets will be repeated for all the values in the sequence from 12 to 40 in steps of eight. So you, it will first do for 12, then it will increase E cut by eight, which is 20. Then it will do that for 20 and it will keep on doing that. So you don't have to manually change anything. Uh, the, the, the template file is, is here, PWSISEF in. So this template file has already been uh, put uh, E cut WFC to 12. Right, and uh, so all of this is uh, is set up. So the the species and the atomic uh, the this is where you specify your pseudo potential file. So this is called the atomic species card, where you specify what are the type of the atoms, its mass, and its uh, what you call the uh, pseudo potential file that you're going to use. These are the positions, and you start something with a exclamation mark it's going to be a comment then uh, you have a k points card which is automatically given with a four by four by four k points which i will get back uh, in a little while after we run this convergence test for the ecard wc okay any questions here probably lots of questions um, so let me go through the let me run this and then let's go so because I cannot, I don't have input files unless I run this. So let's run this. The command to run this uh, pwtk script is pwtk and then you cut wc pwtk and then you execute this. Uh, it's going to show you what it's doing. Uh, it's going to run the cut wc 12, 20, 28, 36. So it only ran 36 and then it's going to plot everything and show you the plot itself. So everything is now automated. You can quickly do this. Um, so if you understand how to construct this, you just need to have one file and the script and it will automatically run all the iterations you want. You know, so we ran one, two, three, four iterations. Uh, we can modify the script to have more iterations if you want that. So let me go to the nano editor or you can also choose this one. There's an editor here, Pluma. And uh, with the Pluma editor, you can go and uh, open a file. So you have to navigate to the desktop, day two, example one, silicon, ECAT FC, ECAT WFC, and then PWTK. And so that is your file. So let's say I don't want uh, only 40, let's, I want to go to 50, right? Uh, so I'll go one step further. And let's uh, increase by four and see. Sorry, uh, increase by four. Let's save this. And now, if you go here and uh, look at uh, sorry, not that this one, now you see that it's changed twelve four fifty. So I changed with that word, which was eight to four and this to fifty. So it reflects in the more command. Now we go and run the uh, PWTK file. So if you do the up and down arrows, it can go back and forth on the commands you executed. You don't have to type the same command over and over again. So up and down arrows will uh, navigate the history of the commands. So yeah, let me go and do that and let's see what happens. Now it runs more calculations. 12, 16, 20, 24, 28. So it's going four by four now. So I don't have to specify each of these. It's, it's taken up by the code itself. So it went up 
goes up to 40. Now you see a very smooth curve, right? Because you have more points, you see the curve converging. And uh, if, uh, if you want a really good uh, number value, so it's 8 point, uh, minus 15.85 Pittsburghs here uh, at the last uh, convergence, it's, it's between 8, 0.850 and 0.855. So just by looking at the graph, uh, you might think, okay, 40, 45 is the best area because it's, it's coming really close down there. So that convergence test is very easy to run when you have a script set up. So this is why uh, Burai is not a very good GUI. It's a good GUI to get familiar, but if you want to run multiple calculations, then you definitely have to transfer to using the scripts. Um, so this data is being recorded. So it spits out these input and output files for each of these calculations and the data is in this file. So let's do a more on that. And now you see for each cut off the amount of energy that was recorded. This is the total energy. This is the E cut WFC, which specifies the number of plane waves used to represent the ionic core pseudo potential for the ionic cores. Okay. So, so you can see that it converges to the second decimal point. Uh, fairly quickly, 30s, it, it converges, but uh, the 36, it converges, no, at least 40, it converges to third decimal point, right, in, in Rydberg's. So in Rydberg's, it comes to the uh, third decimal point in the 40s, so you can use this particular value. 40 is good enough, right, so because of, beyond that, the third decimal point is 333, okay? All right, any questions? Please cast some questions. I have a question, Dr. Anikar. Yeah, yeah. So this is for silicon one unit cell, right? But if you increase the layers, then uh, the cutoff will have to be different, no? I mean, for a larger system, if we have to do these uh, multiple runs. Not, no, not necessarily, no, no, no. Okay. Because the, this is, uh, you're, you're giving the pseudo potential cutoff per atom, right? So okay. this is the localized, this is the localized pseudopotential to, re to represent the ionic core of an atom. You're not giving this for the entire system. This is going to be replicated for each atom. So if, let's say you have 40 atoms. This pseudopotential um, uh, function is going to be implemented on all 40. Uh, okay. This will be different, I think, if you are doing an isolated system. Mm -hmm. You have to, if it is an isolated system, you push the boundary a little bit more. You go to maybe you try to see of course you have to have the system and then run the convergence but for the periodic the number of atoms doesn't really matter okay so yeah good question yeah so um, we can try that i mean we can we can do a periodic and see whether it changes but uh, it should not because this is this is per, per atom uh, i i like if you're doing a surface then it's not a periodic right surface uh, one of the, it's not periodic in one direction. If yeah. that's the case, then you increase the cutoff a little like bit. Uh, absorbing something on the surface, then I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a different system. But if it's periodic in all three directions, then it sees a bulk, like it, it, the, you, then you have to use only the smallest cell that you can, right? Okay. That's another point. Yeah, you don't want to use, let's say you, if you are doing a bulk, you don't want to use 10 atoms when you can do that in two. That is, that's the same calculation you're doing. But now, because you're putting 10 atoms, it's going gonna, it's gonna to replicate the 10 atoms and it's going to calculate everything for 10 atoms when it could have done for two and replicated it. So your calculation increases, but you're not, not getting anything out of it because uh, the bulk is bulk, however you look at it. So because of the periodic boundary condition, because even if it is two and if it's it's the same structure, then you're better off running two because that is the computational overhead is really low when you're running a low number of atoms. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, I, I don't know whether we can have, let's see, I cannot interface with Burai here, but we should have a tool. 
which we could probably replicate. Uh, I'll get back to it when we get which tool to use. I think we had one. They might not have included it here. Uh, there is a tool where you can uh, replicate, uh, yeah, multiply this system and then, uh, and then do that, but it's not here. It's, then it's called a supercell. It's not your, uh, when, you have, when you have the same bulk, but you have more atoms, it's called, you call it a supercell. So supercell calculations you can do, but, and then not change the uh, uh, cutoff as well. Yeah. So, uh, any any other questions uh, on uh, before we move on? So that is the cutoff convergence. So, uh, so let's. I, I will go into one of these files now and see. Let's go into forty. In. So you see, there are a bunch of cards. So any everything that starts with an end is a card. The ampersand sign. That's a, that's a section of parameters that we give to this. Uh, to the software. So the control tells you where the output directory is and, uh, and the prefix gives you uh, a name for the output directory and the pseudo directory gives the location where the pseudo potential file, which is this particular file is located. At. Okay. So that stuff is given here. Then this is giving uh, the primitive defining the lattice vectors. So you can do uh, eyebrow zero and give your own lattice vectors at the bottom here. Okay, uh, before I move on, I will go into, uh, I will tell you how to access the help for the, all of these <coughs> cards and keywords. It's very easy. You type, just type, uh, what's that? something happened. So you just type input, capital, everything capital, underscore PW. Right? Input underscore PW, this is an HTML file, you can save it also. So it will give you the input uh, file description from Condom Espresso. And uh, I always type that, okay, there is saying something. So Chris can continue. So this particular file, this is just one file. Uh, you can save this onto your desktop. It's worth saving it. So, um, and save page uh, into the desktop and you can keep it there uh, because uh, you, you will be needing that. So save, let's save that. And, uh, and then once you save it, you can open it from the, from the browser as well uh, because you might, if you lose internet, you are not uh, alone with, without the instructions. So here you go. So you have the instructions here. So this is also now um, divided into these three or four cards. Well, actually, there's a bunch of other cards that, that, that we, are, we normally don't use. But uh, control system and uh, electrons and ions, uh, we normally use and the cell we use to give the uh, cell dynamics and how how the cell has to change and then we we can use atomic species to say what species are there atomic positions to list the positions k points and then cell parameters is the one where you uh, define your own lattice vectors so in system if you so if you go to the first card control and the first keyword calculation this defines which type of a calculation you are running. So we are running an SCF calculation, right? So that's the default, I think. So the default is SCF. So if the default is SCF, you don't have to specify that default, which is why they have not. So you see only a few cards change because all the others are going to have the default value. 
they are not without a value, but they have a default value. So if you go verbosity, default value low, restart mode from scratch. So most of these, uh, they are going in a default value. So default is one if uh, for SCF, for this number of steps. So you have to get familiar with these, uh, with these keywords and, and look at uh, what these uh, keywords are telling you. Uh, if you're running a, 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 what we call an optimization calculation, you need to specify the stress. Um, if you want to print the stress or not, if you want to print the forces uh, and, and things like that you have to do. So max seconds was there in, uh, in the Burai because uh, they have to ask you to stop after a maximum number of seconds. Uh, otherwise your computer might hang up. So that's why probably they have put that in there. So there's a bunch of these keywords that you can go through. Uh, any keyword you don't understand, the easiest thing to do is copy it from here. So let's say you don't understand eyebrow. So you can copy this from here and then find it here. You control, uh, yeah, you can do a find in your um, browser and then it, it gives you this particular keyword and you can go through the keyword and understand. So zero is free structure and you have to specify the cell parameters yourself. One is cubic. Uh, simple cubic, two is face centered, three is body centered, four is hexagonal, and so it goes on uh, to where how you can specify the that group crystal system cycle. Uh, all of them using this 15, yeah, 15 uh, methods to, uh, to list them. So I think there are 16 classes of crystals. I am not familiar with that. So, however, we normally use FCC, BCC, and if we have uh, our own, like uh, maybe a weird structure that is not so common, then we will, we can get the parameters from certain uh, websites. Uh, I normally uh, recommend Materials Project or a Flowlib, where you can download what we call a SIF file and then uh, from the SIF file, you can get the information or you can also convert that to uh... So both of the materials project and the airflow lib are computational databases, which uh, you can just go and search for your compound and then basically find uh, a structure for that. Uh, yeah, you have to sign in for materials. Here you don't have to sign in, so I'm gonna go there. Uh, so let's say you want to search, you go to search here. And the, here you can select your combinations. So let's say titanium dioxide. Uh, I want one, one, and let me number of species. I want to limit to two. Uh, and that's all, yeah. So let's search. And I get a bunch of values with the space group. So I go and look at one of these uh, compounds. It will give you your um, structure visualization here. So it's very easy now to get get the uh, get the parameters here. So it gives you relax. This is already run in VASP. Uh, so they have run this and they have given you given you all the data here, but um, if, to get the structure, this is a good place as well. So you can get the SIF file uh, if you want to look at that, or you can go and look at the output or the input files for this um, particular cell. And then you can also build super cells. So if you want a two by two by two, uh, you can build that. So it replicates the cell pretty quickly. Uh, and then uh, let's see, there was this as calculated standard conventional. The output files are there, so you can look at the yeah, structure geometry. So you go to geometry, no, not that one. There should be the output files. Downloadable files entry. 
Yeah, there you go. Uh, you have all the files that were run. And uh, if you're familiar with WASP, you can, yeah, here you go. You have the QE geometry of the relaxed position. So that you can uh, download directly. Oh, some reason that's not working for this particular one. Let's see whether we have the WASP. Oh, it's not working. So downloadable files for some reason is not working. Let's see if the SIF is working. If the SIF is working, then you can download the SIF, import it to Burai and generate the file. That's uh, pretty easy to do. Yeah. So the SIF is open. Yeah, you can you can download that. So Burai can open that, uh, and even Burai has, uh, I think, a few of these uh, compounds. Then then you can uh, start uh, with your calculations. So the atomic positions and all of that can be done like that. And uh, number of atoms you have to specify. Ibra is this we just talked about, it, and number of not the not number of types of atoms you have to specify. And then the electrons is the card that handles the electronic structure, the SCF parameters. The self-consistent field parameters are handled by the by the electron card. So if you want to go up, there should be an up arrow back to top. So you go back to top and then electrons uh, it will have number of maximum steps. SCF must converge is default true. Convergence threshold. Now, this is an interesting parameter. I will tell you what that parameter means. To say that parameter, to uh, tell you about that parameter, I have to go to the output file. And this is where you're saying uh, the electron densities. Right, um, so uh, the the electron density is being tried over and over. So when when they when they when you when the SCF cycle is started, I, I mentioned that we we start this SCF cycle, right, and we we give the potential for the ionic cores. We have an initial guess. We do one calculation, compare the density we get with the initial guess and see the difference. That's one iteration. And that iteration is reflected here. So self-consistent calculation starts here and it says iteration one, uh, E cut is given here. And then uh, this beta parameter is, uh, is, a, is a mixing parameter. That is how much of the earlier density is mixed with the uh, with the later density of the uh, electrons. And then a threshold is given. The threshold is uh, uh, minus two, 10 to the power minus two. And the average number of iterations is given here. So each of these iterations uh, go through the, uh, uh, one of these SCF cycles. So it gives you an estimated accuracy here and total energy and estimated accuracy. And we want this to go down until it reaches a certain threshold. And that threshold is given by this convergence threshold. Okay, That's the estimated energy, accurate, energy error should be less than convergence threshold. So less than the default is 10 to the minus six. So let's see how much we have. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So 10 to the minus six is there. So once you have that, uh, this stops. So the, in the next iteration, so this is exactly six. This went down from six to E, EHR to eight. So this is minus seven, this goes to eight, and therefore it stops after that. It says end of self-consistent calculation here. And then it does all the other calculations. It does the total energy, uh, accuracy of the SCF accuracy is given. And then uh, it, it says convergence achieved in five iterations of the SCF cycle. So in the electronic, uh, in the, the electronic uh, calculation, if you want to increase the threshold, we can. We can give this to be 10 to the minus eight, it will increase the number of accurate, 
uh, increase the number of uh, iterations that that you uh, use. So let's go to the input file uh, that we have here. Uh, we can open the input file directly. So let's take the 40 because 40 is the one that is converged. And let's uh, converge this to, uh, we can have a convergence threshold here. EHR, and then you can specify one E minus zero eight. That's, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, one E minus, they're using D, that's also fine. I think E works as well, so you can use D. Uh, that's a Fortran uh, convention. So if you do that, uh, then, then this will again, uh, you'll have to run this. And if you're running from the command line, uh, you just type PWX input, uh, PW the input file. This is the file we want to have the input and then output uh, PW 40 out. So these things are detailed in the uh, handouts. And now you see, you can interactively see it running. It ran pretty quickly. Uh, it went to six iterations and estimated accuracy went down to minus nine because we requested eight. And uh, and this went down to minus nine. So it came from eight to nine here. Uh, increased the accuracy, probably changed the energy a bit as well. So that you can decide how accurate you want it to get. Uh, and then uh, the, okay. So the more accurate your self-consistent cycle is, the more accurate is your energy. So let's say you are converging at 10 to the minus four and you get an energy that changes if you uh, increase it to 10 to the minus eight, right? You're not going to get the same energy. This energy is now different because your electron density has, uh, has, be, has changed on which you are calculating the energy. So energy is a functional of the, um, of the, uh, ground state electron density. And that's, that's one of the Hohenberg Cohn theorems, um, which, is, which is used uh, to, to calculate the uh, energy density. The other theorem is that uh, the ground state energy minimizes the system. So when it comes down, when, it, when these iterations goes down, uh, in, in the thresholds goes down, uh, the accuracy of the SEF calculation increases which means the accuracy of your result that SCF cycle increases, which means the accuracy of the measurement tool that you're using like energy or whatever that you're gonna measure, that increases. So convergence is very important. So this is why uh, you will have to understand what these keywords mean in terms of convergence um, and how to use them to increase the accuracy of a calculation. Okay, um, so any questions? I know this is, uh, I'm, I'm giving uh, a lot of information in a very small time. I that, that, that this is why I encourage you to go and uh, download this system. This is gonna be a very uh, high speed, I mean, uh, introduction to this. So you can go to this, uh, these web, the, if you go to this day two, and the day two has a, a, a handout that gives you a lot of information, right? I mean, I don't have the time to go through all of this. It tells you about the brilliant zone sampling, how to run the PWX code, um, how to type the command, all of that is given here, right? Uh, and uh, how to look for the self-consistency, how, how, how it proceeds. Uh, convergence test for silicon bulk, how we are going to do that. So all of that is given here. Um, most of that, what we discussed is, is here. here. I, I went through that pretty fast, uh, but, uh, but you can review this. Uh, it's, it's very easy to review. 
Um, and it also gives you a basics on the PWT case scripting, which is, which is very powerful because uh, you can automate a lot of stuff with that. Uh, and uh, the other thing that they're using is something called Gnuplot. Uh, the, they have a Gnuplot script built into this, uh, built in the sense, if you look at the ECUT PWTK script, at the end of it, it is executing a Gnuplot command. It says plot GP. And if you look at uh, plot GP, it's, it's a, a bunch of commands to plot. And it's, it's producing the plot with this particular, um, with this particular line. So since we, uh, we changed, uh, yeah, let's see, let's see. We changed one energy because we, we ran that with an increased uh, accuracy, right? So then uh, you, you change your, um, your data set. So what, what, one thing we can do is we can increase the accuracy and see whether we can run them both and see whether we can compare them. So let's, let's do that. So to do that, I have to back up. So let me copy this e dot file into a e dot dot back. So copy is just CP and, it, and you, can, you have to give the next name uh, because this is gonna be now replaced when I run it back again. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna change this template file. So this template file uh, does not have anything in the electrons. So what I'm gonna do now is put the convergence threshold here. So earlier it was, the default, which is 10 to the minus six. So let's increase this to one D, one dot D, one dot D minus eight. So that's, let's do that. Can even give a comma here. And then uh, to save this, I have to type WQ and close. And now uh, I can again run the PWTK script, which is the automated script to run this entire calculation. So if you do that now, it will take a little bit more time, but not a lot, but it, it runs now. So you see it takes a bit more time when we increase this. Uh, now, what you want to do is you want to compare these two files, which you can do. You do a diff command on the ecut.dat and ecut.dat back. And if you do that, uh, you also can do a y command here, I think, and it will do it side by side. And you see that the energies are changing, right? The back uh, and the ones do not have the same energies. Can you see the energies changing? Um, so they're not changing a whole lot, but you have a change in the energy. But uh, if you look at this, uh, that's beyond. So you, you see it's beyond the third decimal point. The changes are beyond the third decimal point. So which are negligible, right? So the improvements are negligible. So therefore, it is, this is a converged up to here. So the increase to 10 to the minus eight doesn't change anything up to here. So only after that it changes. So things like that, it's nice to notice. And uh, you can quickly look at these changes um, and with a few commands, you can look at this very easily rather than clicking open and going through plotting in Excel and doing all that in, in uh, Windows. This is why um, I would encourage you to use Linux whenever you're running calculations with this because it, it less chance to make errors because if it's automated, it, it probably won't make an error. Uh, you can also plot this, this will be right on top of each other. So if you do the plot GP and uh, if we copy that and we do,
are back, but I want to change the color. Or oh, let's increase. The, I think this fine. How to change the color? I forget. Let's increase this to eight and see that point that might work. So. So you do that, uh, it's right on top of each other, I think. I cannot do this. Uh, I think I forget how to plot two new plots in the same one. Let's see whether this works. I'm not sure. Might be an error. Oh, no. there you go. You get the two plots, uh, but uh, you see they are right on top of each other because there is uh, there's there's not a lot of uh, difference between the between increasing this particular threshold. Okay, so uh, it, this is very easy. I mean, uh, if you, I mean, there's a learning curve for the commands. I agree, but uh, then once you get used to it. Getting things done is really easy. So you see the labels also here, um, the e dot versus cut dot that and that is there uh, in the green color and it's right on top of each other. So no uh, visible improvement in uh, increasing the convergence threshold. Okay. <clears throat> the other convergence test is the K points that you want to uh, modify on. That's the next important uh, parameter in this, uh, in this calculation. Uh, yeah, we are here. So I went through this. Let me see if I have something on the K points. Yes. So there's something called the block theorem that uh, uh, that's been used for periodic systems and uh, the wave function obeys the block theorem for periodic systems. So the wave function is periodic according to the block theorem. Uh, the wave function is, I'll remind you, the wave function is our solution for or, or our numerical object that we have to represent the physical system. And that object, you can solve for this small unit instead of the whole unit. So instead of uh, solving, having a, a function for 10,000 atoms, you can have it for two atoms. It will be the same thing, but repeated according to the block theorem. So that solution can be for 10,000 atoms, it is repeated according to the block theorem uh, using what we call these K vectors. The K vectors are, are not in the real space, they are in what is called a reciprocal space or a reciprocal lattice. And this comes as a result of the block theorem. So you have something called a reciprocal lattice, which is, uh, which is different from the real crystal lattice, but it is a, a confined or a, it is a reduced lattice in the sense, uh, uh, you can't say reduced if, it, if it, it's an it's a inverse lattice of the real system. So if you have a large system, let's say you have 50 angstrom, 100 angstrom system, your reciprocal lattice becomes really small because your, your uh, system is large, but it's very dense now because you have a lot of points. Uh, but if your system is very small, you, are, you have one isolated atom, your reciprocal space is now really big. So you have to sample a lot of space. So, um, it's, it's uh, in, you have to think inverse in, when you're thinking of reciprocal lattice. So why is this important? This is important because all the K-point sampling, what we call K-point sampling is, now the equations have to be integrated in the reciprocal space. So if you know, if you can remember integration, integration needs a certain number of points uh, for, for numerical integration, right? If you have a function, and you want to integrate these two points, 
you have to decide on the optimal number of points you're going to break this down into to calculate these smaller areas to find the total area. So definitely, if you just have one or two areas, your uh, error is larger because now you, these, these particular uh, regions you're going to miss. But let's say you have multiple, uh, you, you divide this much more finer and then, then you have multiple areas and you're now you're only just missing a small amount of this, uh, of this area because you are now approximating this to be a trapezium and uh, that, that trapezium is very much uh, in line with the, with the actual curve. So if, how much of points are you going to put here will decide on the accuracy of your result. So this is what the k-point grid is about. And the k-point grid you give uh, in the, in the uh, x, y, z, so you give like two by two by two or four by four by four. If your axes, the crystal axis, a1, a2, a3 are of the same length. So for simple cubic, we know that uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, in, uh, it's the same length uh, for simple cubic crystal systems, right? So therefore you can go with four by four by four two, or two by two by two, four by four by four. You can also do odd numbers. And I know WASP has a, a different accuracy for odd and even numbers. So if you have even numbers and odd numbers, they recommend some, I forget now, but if you read their manual, uh, the WASP software has a different guideline, but it doesn't matter. You can, you can have this particular K-point grid uh, convergence by just changing these numbers and seeing how the energy converge similar to the one that we ran for the energy cutoff. So of course, the more K points you have, the more accurate you get. For example, the Airflow-Lib library of uh, materials calculations that I just showed you uh, that I drew up from, uh, yeah, I think I showed you in the article in the box, right? So this particular uh, file, uh, this particular database is all constructed using, um, unfortunately we can't see the input file. It's, it's about 10,000 K points. So they, they had enough computing power that they didn't, they, they didn't bother to do the K point conversion. They said, okay, default 10,000 K, K points, we are gonna do. Um, and if something goes wrong, we will uh, increase it more, even more. So 10,000 K points is, is really a lot. And it, it, uh, it, even if you say 10,000 K points, it reduces it. Reduces it. Uh, the software has a capability of reducing the, based on the symmetries of the K points, they don't use, it doesn't use 10,000, but it will reduce that number and it will use uh, the number of points that are symmetrically inequivalent. So uh, that, that, that's done by the software. But, uh, but you have the ability to increase that number by specifying a larger number yeah, when you start the calculation. But if you have limited computing power, you don't want to do that. And if you don't have uh, 10,000 cores to run your calculation on, uh, or 10,000 processors to run the calculation on, you want to optimize. I mean, if you have four processors or like 16 or maybe 36 processors, uh, then, uh, the CPU count is very limited and therefore you want to optimize your calculation as much as possible. So that can be done here. Um, and you do a similar script. Uh, you just change that parameter where we, so that is the exercise number two. So if you go to this exercise uh, ex2.k points, that is the exercise two. And if you look at K point PWTK, what it does is the similar thing. It takes the template in and now it says K point automatic dollar K dollar K dollar K one, one, one. One, one, one is a shifted grid uh, that's discussed in the handout. I'm not going to go through that. Uh, it's better to run a shifted grid than have zero, zero, zero here. So you have these parameters going in these numbers, two, four, six, eight. So you're gonna have two, 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 four, 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 six, 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 eight, eight, eight. And then you're gonna uh, find the total energy, extract it out, plot it. So everything done by the script. So 
So just you just run this command pwtk k points and uh, it will run that and plot it. So you see from two to four, there's a sharp decrease in the energy from 794 to 806 or below 806. After four, you have very small decrease to six and then to eight. So uh, I normally don't look at the graph. I look at the, the you have to look at the uh, file. So if you look at the, the energy convergence, the third decimal is reached at four. Uh, so four is more than enough for this system. You don't have to go to eight. So uh, that's that's uh, that's how you would do a K point uh, convergence. Again, you look at the energy and see uh, whether it converged up to that point. So um, you can change this. I mean, you can run. Um, you can run even. Oh, it's not that one. So we can put the odd numbers here and see. So we can put three here, five, seven. That can be done. Then you can run this again. Now it's gonna run two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's easy as just changing a few num few characters there, and then you see you have a little bit of a bumpy. Uh, Thing is, if you use odd numbers, uh, then they they give you they don't they you have a certain amount of rise here. It comes down to five, but it rises up a little bit at six, and then so it's better to use five than six in this particular case. So if you want to you go from four to six, don't you can get more accuracy with five. So that's why there's a uh, there's a um, difference between the odd and the uh, even uh, grids. So you can look at this even here, you will see five is seven, five, uh, six is eight, five, seven. No, oh, that's different. Let's see, seven, three, seven, five, four, seven, five, seven, 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 three. No, it's this steadily decreasing. I think I saw it wrong. So. Thought five increased, five decreased. I thought. No, I think it's a. It's my eyes. I, I see it as decreasing, but it's not. Now it, it steadily decreases, so it, it's not coming back up because six is it's seven five seven. So I mean, this is the 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 almost the last convergence test that you do before you. Uh, if you do, do a real calculation, right? So this, this for the system, you have to do these two tests, and uh, and then for this particular system, it, because this is an insulator uh, or a, or a semiconductor, it's not a metal. But when it comes to metal, there's something called smearing, and uh, that has to be uh, done as well as a convergence test. But once you're comfortable with doing these calculations, uh, you probably know okay. I don't have to, I mean, you're, you're not gonna use a two by two grid uh, for that particular system. You know, I need to at least use a four by four or a six by six. So you don't have to uh, do multiple tests, but you do one or two, you do a four and you do a six and see what's the difference. And if, if it's not too much of a difference, then you just uh, go with the four. Um, so these things are standard procedures to make sure that your calculation is Converge because we are going uh, in an iterative procedure to converge to a solution. So convergence has to be checked. Okay, the other one that we can do now is now we know, okay, 4K points is okay, 40 is fine for the cutoff. Then what we can do is uh, we can optimize the structure parameter, the lattice parameter and ask, what is the optimum lattice parameter? So that's a structure property we are going to ask, but based on based on the energy. So again, uh, so again, you use the the script, uh, and 
let, let me check which is now we are using here. Okay, convergence threshold is modified, but that doesn't make a difference. It cut WFC is set to 12 here. But let's see the script. So here, uh, you let inputs. Okay, so we have to put the value here, uh, which is 40, which is the one that we got from the EW, e cut WFC exercise. And then you had to put the value for K points, which is four by four by four and one, one, one. So you put four, 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 one, one, one for the K points. And uh, that's that those are the values that we got from, um, from the earlier two exercises. So that, that's our convergence test. And uh, do that and then we just run this. Now, what does this do is, this is gonna insert a lat parameter, which is the parameter, if you look at a lat, that's the parameter where uh, we specify the length of the side of the box. So we optimize the side of the box uh, for this particular case. So a lat, uh, if you want to find that, just do a lat. Yeah, a lat gives it in angstroms or in cell dimensions. Uh, you can you can give the a lat to be the side of the uh, the length of the uh, box, which means like if you have a simple cubic box. Again, your simple cubic box has lengths. And inside this box, sorry, inside this box, you have atoms, right? Uh, you have a basis and you have two, two atoms here. I think it's something like that. So, um, and you're saying the, each of these dimensions are AAA. And that is, that, that A you're changing from 9.7 to 10.7. That's what you're doing. Uh, you're, you're basically uh, ex expanding the box from 9.7 to 10.7 in steps of 0.1. So the sequence command takes the steps in 0.1 and then it calculates the energy and stores it in a file. So that's basically what this does. So let's quickly run this and WTK. So again, it, uh, this is running the SCF calculation. There's nothing different. You are just changing parameters and running the SCF calculation and looking at the energy and then plotting it to see uh, what is the best uh, value to minimize the energy. So that, that's it. And then you get the curve, a very ni nice smooth curve. And uh, you see that uh, the minimum lies somewhere close to 10.2, the lattice parameter in both is 10.2. This is not angstroms because uh, this works in atomic units for the uh, for the quantum espresso. WASP works in works, works in uh, angstroms and EVs, but uh, this particular software works with Bohr radius and uh, Rydberg's. So you get the Rydberg energy and the Bohr radius. If you want, you can convert these. It's fine. You just need to include that in the script. Uh, couldn't open. Oh, I might have deleted a file. Yeah, I deleted an input file. So that's why I cannot uh, run the EV curve. So let me get that file quickly.
So it was, oh, sorry, it was not there. It's in silicon. And yeah, I'm, I'm using this file, copy link address. I have to switch between the operating systems because otherwise I cannot get it into the uh, into this operating system. So see, there we go. We can get that file, and you can just copy this file and put it in here. So, so the last command didn't run. So let's look up the last command. Alat. Uh, right. What we can do also is we only want to run the last command. So we comment out the run pw command so that it doesn't run. Comment that out, it won't run. And uh, this also you have to comment out, otherwise it will modify the comment out everything here. So it, will, it won't modify anything. So it will run the last uh, few commands only. This happens. As I copied it, there might have been a character that came up that is not recognized by the software. Uh, it's not working. Let's download this and see whether it works with that. What I wanted to show was that Let's try it again and see whether it will work. Hopefully, it will work. Mm. Okay, it worked. So what it does is it, it, it you now the, the the calculated values are given here for each of these lattice parameters, and it fits what we call the Murnaghan state equation of state. It fits it and gives us the actual minimal energy. So it basically fits a parabolic curve to the to the. Uh, uh, it fits the parabolic curve to the uh, calculated energy results and gives you the actual minimum energy, which is, which is not part probably of the results here. So if you see minus 15.85304 is not here. You have 306 and 219, but the actual minimum is between these two. So it, it's, it, you have to run this uh, uh, curve fitting software, curve fitting software to get that. And also uh, the, the angstrom value uh, is, is uh, not the angstrom value, the, 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 the lattice parameter value is 10.2077, which is not part of the data here. It is between 
10.2 and 10.3. So that is also taken in from the curve fitting. So you fits a curve, the parabolic curve, and uh, parabolic data, that's the, the data that lies on a parabolic curve and then gives you the uh, minimal um, or the equilibrium lattice parameter and the minimal energy. So that gives you a, a general idea of uh, how we uh, optimize the structure. So now we know the correct convergence parameters, the uh, cutoff energies, the k-point grids, the convergence thresholds, and now we have found out uh, the correct lattice parameter as well, which is 10.2077. Because without this, the, the we know the, from the density functional theory, it says the correct energy will minimize, the, the correct electron density will minimize the energy. So once you do that from a number of lattice parameters, you get the optimal lattice parameter, the equilibrium lattice parameter predicted by DFT for this system. Now, any property after that, like any electronic properties that you're going to look at, should be looked at from simulating a system that has this particular lattice parameter. So the next one would be to plot a band structure or, or to see the electronic states, uh, the, the, the states of energy that, uh, that the electrons can occupy inside of this system, and to see that you will have to um, you will have to simulate or, or, or run the calculation with with this lattice parameter, which is ten point two zero seven seven. Now that is the next exercise. So if you go to exercise three four point uh, sorry, it's outside of this exercise four bands. Then uh, again, I don't want to remove anything because okay. We look at bands PWTK. There's an input says insert, insert, and insert. So these things we have to insert. These are the things that we took from the earlier calculations, which will uh, give us a converged uh, value for this particular. So the 3077, this was 40. And K points we. By four by four and one one one. And for a band's calculation, normally you can uh, you can go to a uh, a k point that is that is not shifted, as well as you can increase the k points a little to get a more smoother band structure. So we can, even though it's four four is enough, let's increase this to six, and let's put this to zero zero. You don't go down, but you go up. That's that's fine. Uh, run the bands calculation here. Yeah. So there's a whole other story in the bands calculation. So if you look at the v bands dot input file. Sorry, no. Silicon dot input file, uh, no, the other one. That's that has a different uh, set of k points, and I'm not going to go into this uh, set of k points. This is the this is a k point path through the uh, non equivalent. Uh, symmetrical k points in the uh, in the in the uh, crystal structure. So this k point path goes through a number of points, and uh, the, it, it has been given to have thirty nine k points, so that the graph will be smoother. So that is explained in in the videos uh, in the school as well as in the uh, in the handouts. Uh, you might want to go through and see how to get the bands using that particular k point path. Um, if you go to a flow lib, that path is normally displayed. Uh, let's see whether we can whether they can be shown here. Uh, the k point path is normally displayed. Show plane. No, not that. Not that.
some reason it's not working today. It is not showing me the files, so I cannot show you today. But uh, these these K point paths are being uh, shown for this. That's a that's a path that is going to a certain number of K points in the reciprocal space, and uh, it gives you the a nice uh, nice graph at the end. So let's run this and see what we get. Okay, didn't accept this. Oh, yeah, these I'll have to take out. There we go. That should work now. Yes. So it first runs an SCF calculation, then it runs a bands calculation, and then it, to plot the bands, it needs to generate the bands output that file that is generated through the bands.x command. And finally, you get uh, the bands of the uh, silicon. Uh, these k points L, this tau, this x, these are given, this is given in the path. So the path is constructed using that. So um, if I quickly show you, um, so you can do an XPristen. Uh, there's a software called XPristen and PWI. PWI. And and this. Huh? Let's see if I can open this. Okay. And we can say display and uh, K path selection. So this is the uh, reciprocal space of this object. Okay, so this is a very nice way of showing you. So the real space, you see the atoms, and this is the reciprocal space of that particular uh, uh, real space area. So here you can select these paths. So you want to select the path, this is the gamma point, and then uh, you want to select the next path like that, and you come here like that. So it says L, K, it selects. So these, so if you look at the graph, it went from L, tau, X, W, K, L. So I don't know where these things are, but if you want to figure that out, uh, you can just, uh, yeah, you go like that. And that's another, yeah, take that out. I made a mistake. And so tools, k-path selection. So from there, you, you select the gamma point and then my mouse is clicking all over the place. So that's why. Open delete last selected point, okay. And that's a K and maybe this is a L, uh, maybe this is a X, no. This, maybe this one is another K, so we don't need that. Uh, that's a W, that's another L. So you have to figure out where the X is. Yeah, there you go. There's an X. And uh, you end up uh, with the L, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you end up with the L. So, like that, if you generate this and you say, okay, rotation, select uh, uh, number of selected points, six, and you want to give uh, step. 
I don't know. I think you can say this is like 40 or something. 40, and if you say, okay, can't we? So, work. Those are the reciprocal vectors, and then, yeah, you can go through the handout, but this is what you normally do. You will generate this, but it's giving me an error. So anyway, you select the path like this, and then you can generate the points through X Kristen, uh, which which might take a while if I want to do that. So um, in this particular um, space, it's plotting where the electrons can stay in terms of energy. So energy Rydberg's, the, these, any of these bands up to here, the five are the, uh, what we call the, uh, the core, right? The, they are the, they're the conduction bands. So the valence bands lies beyond the energy gap. So you can measure the energy gap at the tau. You can measure the energy gap at X, at L. So all of these energy gaps can be measured. And you can see the band structure, which is basically the electronic characteristic that gives that tells this is a semiconductor because it's uh, it's less than I think uh, from five to seven, maybe three electron volts. Uh, there might be a three or four electron volt. Oh no, three Rydberg uh, value here. So this is this comes. Uh, closer to the semiconductor. If you see an insulator, this gap will be much larger. And in a metal, you will see that it is much closer. And if you don't see a, a gap, it just have a continuation of, of states for the, for the metal. So uh, if, to summarize, you, we, we, are, we are looking at um, what we call, uh, so we, we are looking at to find properties to do a measurement numerically, not physically, right? We want to do a measurement numerically on the system, right? This, this particular system, we are trying to model it using a function, then use a measuring instrument. Um, uh, how we can get the energy gap values from the output in a particular point. Uh, I think there's an output file in there. Let me quickly check. Uh, there's a question, how can you get uh, values for a specific point? So this C band that, that, this gives you the, the values for each of these points. So you have to analyze this one. Um, I think that is, that is described in the summer school, how to do that. So um, that can be done, uh, C bands that and and even the new would do it, I think. Yeah, this also gives you uh, the values for, for each of these, uh, each of these. Now this gives the bands, basically. This is the first band probably uh, that's going from negative three uh, to negative. Yeah, that's all negative. So that's the first band. So then you have the second band coming up and then the third band. So you have the bands coming up here. So you have to select the a specific uh, location from here, get the value here, and then compare that with the other one. And then you can get the gap. Hopefully that is clear. Pasanti, is that clear? Okay, good. So um, that's, that's uh, what I was saying was, so we, we are trying to, model this numerically using the wave function. Then we are trying to find the wave function, apply the measuring instrument to get the energy and or any other stuff, basically energy, because we are plotting the band structure, that's, that's energy. So we are trying to find this. In this process, we are using this iterative, uh, iterative cycle we call the self-consistent field cycle, right? So that, that particular cycle has some convergence steps that you have to run through. And you want to make sure that those convergence steps are followed. 
So one, once you converge to a self-consistent calculation, then only you can go and do a band structure calculation and find out the energies. So uh, those are that is the important thing uh, in in a in a in a DFT calculation. Uh, it's not just running the code, but it's understanding what you're doing. Um, the next one is geometry optimization, which I don't think I have the time to go to, but uh, you, it, it's it's not that uh, complicated. You just uh, instead of an SCF calculation, now you will run a relax calculation. So, or a, or a VC relax where it will optimize the cell by itself. So let me see whether I can show it in Burai. Burai would be much easier. So if you go to Burai, and if you don't want to do a lattice parameter optimization, but you just want to find out the, uh, let's see. If you just want to find out the optimal lattice parameter, and then you do a geometry, no, sorry, instead of geometry, you do an optimize. So the optimize would, uh, if you go and look at the input file, you can see what's the input file. It's a relaxed one. So this will uh, only relax the in the atoms inside the file. But let's say that we have a. They don't have geometry. You can also relax the cell parameters using the VC relax calculation. So instead of doing this, you can do a VC relax here, and uh, and you have to then specify the cell and ion cards, and then uh, it will do a VC relax and give you the optimal uh, parameters for that. And maybe try and quickly run that. Let me see if I can run it uh, in here. So I'm copying the uh, the first uh, set of exercises uh, to the VCR, and uh, let's see. We just start with the CF thirteen, and this uh, we'll have to give. Uh, so you look at these these parameters that are in Burai, and you have to give these parameters. Uh, the calculation type is the one that you want to give, and force convergence. Uh, you want to give that if you want to have uh, an increased force convergence there. It's going to measure the forces between the atoms and uh, it's going to relax until the forces are zero. That's that's what it does. So you can do PC relax. So that's variable cell. So it, it varies the cell. That's why it's called VC relax. Here, the problem is now you have to specify the other two cards. You have to just, even if you don't specify anything, you have to write them. So you have to say ion dynamics. That's how the ions will move inside of the box. And then you have to say cell dynamics, which is how the cell parameters will be changed to minimize the energy. So you don't have to even do any, you don't have to put anything, but and normally we put the algorithm that they want to uh, that you want to use in these systems so if you go back here cell dynamics um, you can specify calculation and then you can specify bfgs damp or whatever to 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 the cell dynamics part so it's not cell dynamics it's cell sorry i missed it up this is cell, and this is ions. So here you say uh, ion dynamics, give BFGS, cell, also you can give cell dynamics. If you make a mistake in the spelling, it will not work. 
So that's the algorithm that it will use. Uh, we are not going to specify anything else other than our uh, convergence parameters, which is uh, this is 40. And we'll put this to 9.7, which is where we started for the ALAT optimization. And let's see whether it arrives at uh, uh, 10.2077, which is the one we got. Oh, sorry, this was 454. That's fine. So now you can just do this. Uh, you can input the file and ask it to output this USI VCR. So now it runs and it's going to print forces and then run again, print forces and run again until it reaches the force convergence threshold. Uh, I'll show you. Okay, I think it's coming to a close. Yeah, it did come to a close. Now, if you look at the output file here, uh, you will see multiple iterations going. So it will start the self consistent iteration here. It's starting the self consistent calculation and then it's first converging. Once it converges, you have a total energy. It calculates the forces on the atoms, right? And then uh, it calculates the pressure. The pressure is uh, kilobars, uh, 196. Now this has to go down to zero or, or, the, or the convergence uh, threshold, which is why it's gonna now change the cell parameter and then run again. So if you want to see the next one, the P has now gone down from 196 to 56 because of the change that it did. So the pressure decreases continuously until uh, it becomes zero. So you can just grep that, grep P of K bar from the output file and it will give you the uh, values that it came down to. So the total stress went down to 0.21 kilobars at the end of this. So it started from 196 and ended up, ended up with 21. 196 means it's compressed. It, it, it has a lot of pressure inside, it has to expand. So the other part we want to grab is the cell. So if you grab the cell and three lines or five lines after the cell, uh, you're gonna see how the cell parameters change. So you start with this parameter here, and then uh, it ended up with this parameter here, right? So your ALAT is 9.7, but it has to be multiplied. Uh, yeah, it has to be multiplied by this cell vector to get the uh, actual lattice parameter, right? So uh, that's how you would get 10.22. Uh, 10.2077 maybe, it might be closer to that, but it, 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 it comes out uh, from these lattice parameters or the vectors. Uh, so this particular way of doing the uh, VC relax, uh, it, it, it uses a geometry optimization algorithm to find what we call a global minimum. It might get stuck on a local minimum also, it might get somewhere here or somewhere here instead of coming to here. So you have to change the parameters and see whether it can come out of there. Okay, so this was, I, I agree, uh, a little bit fast at the end uh, because uh, I had to uh, tell you uh, a certain number of stuff related to convergence. But uh, my advice is if you are interested with this after this workshop, please go and look at the lecture videos. The virtual machine is there for you to experiment on and you can download the hands-on material uh, for all 10 days uh, from, from, the, from the Quantum Espresso GitLab uh, repository. So get those things and uh, just try it out and see whether you can, uh, you can do some calculations with that. So I, I didn't check whether there were any questions. Uh, let me see whether there are any questions posted here.
Um, I think there's a questionnaire, a feedback that you need to fill. I don't know, the, Nadisha, are you here? Nadisha, do we have the feedback form? If you have the feedback form, can you put it to the chat so that uh, they can fill it up? Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, when you did that uh, ALAT variation, and yeah. geometry optimization, what's the difference between the two? Uh, the difference is that with uh, here we only ran a CF calculation and not a relax. All right, okay. So the ions inside the, the ion positions were not changed, mm -hmm. but uh, but when you run uh, when you run this uh, VC relax or the relax, you can actually run the ALAT with a with a the ALAT optimization can be run with uh, what we call a, a relax calculation. So it, uh, it it does it with the with the ion uh, ion optimization. So let me quickly show that. So if you go here to the uh, sample three, here So we can uh, do this and we can say system, uh, how you do this, let's see. Because I'm also not familiar with this. I used to use bash scripts. But now they use this PWTK, it's very easy. I don't have to write any of this. So this is, oh no, this is system. And you have to change the, uh, change the control. So control you'll change. And the keyword to change is the calculation. You have to change the calculation to a relax. And uh, the relax will take care of the ions. So, so then you have to say, okay, ions, uh, and uh, you'll have to do the uh, ion dynamics is equal to BFGS. So then, then now what will happen is in each of the lattice parameter will now be changed. But in each of these uh, calculations, it will also run an optimization for the ions. I'll, I'll sh if this works, I think it will work. If this works, we can see that. Okay, it runs, I think. So once, once you get that, oh, I forgot to... Uh, we can comment it out. I forgot to save the uh, earlier energy file so that you can compare the energies and see if there's a difference. So yeah, let, let's let's. Uh, now there there is not a difference. See because this is a uh, this is ten point two zero seven seven comes out to be the exact, and I I I can remember these values. This was 306 and we had 304. So there was no, there is no difference because this is a perfect crystal. So um, silicon is a very perfect crystal. So you don't have a lot of uh, problems within the ions inside of it. But let's say you, are, you have a complex crystal and then there might be some, if you put an impurity inside of this or whatever. So then this will all change. So then you'll have to do a relax and see. So, but you can do that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, ah, yes. So the evaluation form is there. So please fill that. And uh, okay, I think you know my uh, email. If you want any help, uh, you can also email me in the future. Uh, I will respond as fast as possible, as time permits. But uh, you can email me and ask. Uh, or you can also contact me on myself. So that contact information, oh, sorry, that's wrong, 071. Yeah, that's, that's correct. The first one is wrong. Don't, don't do the double seven, double seven, mine's a more detail. Um, what, what I wanted to say at the end was, uh, about the, the, the databases. So the databases, we have um, a bunch of them. 
And uh, the most famous are the materials project and the airflow lip. I work with the airflow lip. And uh, last this year or last year, we published a paper also on, on, a, on a computational design uh, or a search done on the database. So what you do here is you have a, a, a very good approach to calculate computationally the quantum mechanical properties. And then you need a large computing facility, a high performance computing system. Um, I mean, uh, you don't need like 10,000 cores, but you need at least a, a thousand or 2000 core system to run uh, a decent uh, level calculation. And then you need databases and data mining software to house these databases. So, I mean, these are already done. Uh, so you have these type of computers. These are racks and racks of computers being put. Uh, so this is Stampede, the UT Austin uh, we had access to uh, 100,000 cores. So in uh, 20, 2000, uh, this is in 2016 probably, then they upgraded uh, to a much larger version after that. So once, once that, that was done, you have a database of computational calculations available. Now there are uh, in the airflow lib there are 3.5 million compounds already calculated, so seven uh, 75 million properties done. So you can go and refer them. So this this data is available there for you to uh, access free of charge. So um, any before you run any calculations, just go and look because they have run with the at, like they run with a default value of 10,000 k points maximum number of plane waves they can because they had the computing power. So check that and then see whether you can, uh, you, you can extract the values from there before running a, a, a calculation uh, here. If you have the data available over there and it's very easy to search. Uh, you can also search for electronic properties, magnetic properties, scintillating properties. All of that can be searched from these databases. It's, uh, it's visualized, you can uh, get the band structure with the DOS, all these uh, is available. And, uh, and you, can, you, can, uh, you can basically, without running, some uh, information can be taken up. Of course, when you, when you want to see the effect of an impurity or something like that, that's not there. But, uh, but you can uh, get an idea of, of the basic system or, or, the, or the pure system before going into the calculation. Okay, so um, any other questions? Comments, questions, anything you want to say? I think we'll wind up. I think we are bordering on four hours. So it was a bit intense, I think, uh, but hopefully uh, inspired. Uh, so I'll stop and so thank you for your attention. Dr. Lalita? Yeah. Asha then I have a small question. Sure, sure. Uh, the simulation results, do we need to validate the simulated results always? So, yeah, the, 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 the good question, yeah. So it depends on, on what you're looking at. Uh, so if you if you look at these, uh, um, if you're looking at structure properties, for example, and then you're looking at the optimal uh, lattice parameter. And if you use uh, the, uh, what you call the, um, uh, the local density approximation, right? So the local density approximation will give a very bad lattice parameter because it, it, it has an overbinding effect. And GGA to some extent also has that. So you will get a lattice parameter, uh, let's say less than something that is experimentally observed maybe from an XRD or something. Uh, so you might see that, yes. But, but here the issue is um, that we are not inputting anything from outside into the theoretical framework. So this is different from when you are doing, let's say you, you have a semi-empirical uh, model designed for that particular system based on the experimental data, and then you are running the prediction and saying, okay, it's, it matches. You have already input the data as a, so when I'm running classical molecular dynamic simulations, then I have a model where I input the equilibrium lattice parameter as, the, as a parameter in there. 
to 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 the uh, to to model it. So in this case, we are getting the lattice parameter from what we call first principles. We are getting it from the wave function. We are we are not exactly solving the wave function, but we are also not giving it any data in terms of the uh, in terms of the lattice parameter. It is optimizing itself and giving us that data. So it's it's a good method if you is for for certain cases where you don't have any experimental data to get a, a very much closer value to the experimental. So um, the purpose of the simulation is not always to validate it. You can, you can it's, all, it's, it's basically to give you a guidance to the experimental research. So that is how I see it. You won't get the exact experimental value, but you will get a guidance. Okay, this, this is a viable, material to perform this particular task. Uh, it, it, because let's say you want to have perform it as a semiconductor or, or whatever, uh, a, a metal or a half metal. And there's a problem there also, you have the energy gap. So the energy gap is, is underestimated, right? Uh, in, in, uh, in DFT, which you have, if you have these strongly correlated uh, elements like heavy metals in your system, then uh, the energy gap is going to be not accurate. So you have to correct for it. Uh, so then you have to go to beyond DFT methods such as the uh, ACBN zero or the DFT plus U or the hybrid functionals or something like that. And then uh, if you don't have any indication from experiment, that's what you do. Um, and of course, experiment also can't give you an indication when you say, okay, if I put impurities here and there, how does this effect? Uh, so that's, that's part of uh, the the uh, advantage that you have of, over the experiment. Also, the other advantage is okay. The experiment has a result. What can this be due to? So you can put the impurity at certain places. That was one of my researches. I tried to figure out what happened here in actual in in the theoretical framework. What happens because experimentalists can't say that. So we substituted, we had like 16 configurations, which we test, no, 64 configurations, which we tested um, out of 16 possible uh, places. And, uh, and we sort of could give an indication, okay, these atoms are going to these particular sites to give this particular magnetic ordering. So these type of things can be told, but uh, it's, it's, you can't ex expect 100% accuracy. Yeah. You mean that uh, it is uh, not always necessary to validate if it is a totally new thing? Like no, yeah, uh, yeah. So you, you get a good indication because we are not putting anything from outside. Outside, yeah. But, but uh, again, you have to understand the approximations that we make, mm -hmm. especially to the exchange correlation functional and how the exchange correlation functional behaves. So if you are using a PBE, you know, you, it's a very known fact that uh, it's an overbinding uh, functional. So you're going to get the lattice parameter a little mm. less and you're going to get the energy gap a little less. So you're gonna, you, you know this trend in the result. So you, you can say to the experimentalist, you might get a little bit higher than this, but the ballpark value will be somewhere close to this particular value. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, in that case we'll wind up. So you can stop at one. Nadisha, can you hear us? We cannot hear you. Hello? Yeah, can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um... If there's no more questions, I would like to thank Dr. Lalitha on behalf of all the participants for delivering a valuable lecture on introduction to quantum simulations of materials using quantum espresso soap. I hope everyone here gained a good knowledge and understanding about the today's lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Lalitha, and thank you to everyone who participated for the session. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadisha. Bye-bye. Okay.